Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody out there. Welcome to the trading, learning, and development community. Um, we've got a another TLD cast episode happening this morning. Um, looking forward to the next um, 30, 40 minutes or so. We're talking with Rob Penn of Suddenly Smart here this morning. And this is the first episode in what I'm calling the Meet the Maker series. And what that is, is I'm going to be focusing in this series on a lot of um, a lot of the vendors that are out there. Um, there is, we have L&D has a really, really rich sort of um, vendor. I don't know if I would call it a community, but a selection of, of, of organizations and individuals out there that are totally passionate about L&D have been in it for a really, really long time. And good morning, Alan. Um, and uh, I have learned a ton from the vendors in this space. And I feel like um, people don't turn enough to, uh, to, to the vendor folks uh, as resources. And so I am excited to bring on my first guest for this series, Robert Penn, who, um, I, gosh, I've known you for years. I think that I, you were, um, you know, you were one of the first vendors I kind of like knew on a regular basis that was going to to guild events way back then when, you know, when the when the expo would be in a small ballroom in the smaller Hilton at uh, it in Orlando. And, um, you know, it used to be you and I think it was is it Leif that used to be. Yeah. Yeah, way back in the day. Um, you can feel old, Luis. Yeah, I know. We've been around for a while. I'm really just excited to have you here. And I wanted to just talk to you and ask you uh, um, some questions about about Suddenly Smart, about your tool, Smart Builder, you know, which has been around for a really, really long time. I mean, mm -hmm. um, is it as old as Articulate? Articulate was what, founded around 2002? About the same time. Yeah, man, you've been around, but then I kind of almost feel like you guys are more of a, like sort of like a boutique indie sort of, <laughs> sort of e-learning tool that I want people to to learn a lot more about. And so, um, so yeah, let's let's just uh, I'm, I want to just like get into this and start talking about um, about who you are and 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 your company and your tool. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with with your background. I'm super curious about this. You have been in L and D for you know for for almost 20 years. Um, right. You've got a background in you've got a, a BS in in economics from University of Pennsylvania. You've got an MBA from the Wharton School, and you are now. Um, in L and D and have been in L and D for about 20 years. How did, the, what was that journey like? How did that happen? So I, and like you said, I actually started after my MBA, I started in consulting, strategic management, consulting, operational consulting. I'm getting some serious echo here. You, you might want to just turn down your speakers a little bit if you can. It's the microphone is probably just picking it up. There you go. Yeah. So, um, gosh, going back through the mists of time here, the uh, I don't know if, if if back in around you know the dot com era around 2000 if anyone on the on the on the webinar was around back then you may remember there was a, a guy John Chambers who was the CEO of Cisco and he was quoted widely for this proclamation that he made that the next big killer app in the internet is going to be education and it, some he said something along the lines of it's going to make it's going to be so big that the adoption of or the usage of e learning is or web-based learning was going to make e-learning, sorry, email look like a rounding error. So I'd always wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And in my consulting life, I had done professional development as part of my job. It wasn't, I wasn't like a trainer per se, but that was one of the, the, the roles I had. So I had a background in it and it sounded like an exciting industry to get into kind of based on that kind of excitement that, that I was just quoting you. So we kind of put two and two together and, and got into it with uh, a kind of a different, a different business model than what we do now. You know, we're an authoring tool now, but we started off as um, having a strategy where we wanted to get the, the rights to certain books from well-known authors in, in business topics and, and, and uh, professional development topics and take their books and, and, and turn them into interactive learning. So we started off, we, we, we had the rights to some people Oh, this echoes. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that maybe you might have another browser open, um, might, or maybe even another tab. Check that out real quick, because it sounds like it's just got enough of that delay where that sort of sounded familiar. So um, let's take a look. 
Yeah, and it seems like that is, you know, not, I mean, a somewhat sort of typical way of uh, a, a lot of, like way back when, like getting into e-learning is, is you know, taking that, translating books or, you know, P, you know, mm -hmm. all those types of things, um, you know, into, into an e-learning format. Right. Yeah. So I, I fixed the, the echo. Yeah, that's right. And, and um, so as we were, as we were developing these books, being kind of newbies into the industry, we, we grossly underestimated the amount of effort it takes to create good quality interactive learning. And at the time it was all done with flash, you know, it had to be kind of handcrafted. And to make that process easier for us, we, we started creating templates and uh make that and and we started to realize well maybe other people are having difficulty building stuff in flash and thought well this could be something that's that's of value and we we found some some big companies that wanted to kind of have us take our templates and flesh it out into an actual tool and once we got that first version of smart builder built we decided to change direction entirely and, and not do the co custom content development and just do the authoring tool. And that's, that's how we got started. Wow. So you started out basically building like flash templates, right? For our own in-house use. Right. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And, you know, having done this for, for so long, I mean, what has really kind of like kept you into it? What is it about this particular space that has just, you know, I mean, you have, it, you obviously seem like you have other options, but, you know, you've stuck with L and D for a really, really long time. Is you know, what is it about this, this particular industry that that you enjoy? Um, I think two things. One is I, I definitely enjoy the creative creativity, and I enjoy building a, 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 and and crafting a software product that people find valuable and is and is really useful. I think that's that's a lot of fun, and seeing what people do with it. And one of the reasons I find it so interesting is. You, you put out a product that's got a lot of capabilities and people use it in all sorts of ways that you never imagined. I love just planting that that sort of catalyst and letting people's creativity and, and requirements drive what they build with it and seeing you know, seeing that. So I think that's that's rewarding. Um, and then and then just simply the impact that the that the learning that people produce on the on you know, on the world basically is is valuable. We've done I mean, of course, corporate corporate projects can be a little bit dry. You know, there's, there's the the um, uh, compliance training, which is is not not the most fun. But there's also a lot of stuff that is fun. Like we've we've got um, some like a user just recently uh, is a doctor who's doing training on neonatal uh, care for for infants and how to use like ultrasounds and stuff like that, and doing some really advanced stuff with Smart Builder, doing calculations about. You know, if you've got certain measures in, in blood levels, then you need to be thinking about this. Otherwise, you need to be doing that. And seeing people actually do stuff that's going to make a positive impact in the world is, is also valuable. You know, I, I yeah. love that, you know, because that I think that's what I consistently see amongst amongst, you know, the TLDC, amongst this community, the people that are. Um, you know that are that are particularly prolific with like e-learning and 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 build great projects like for instance Jonathan Rock J Rock that's it's in the audience right now the stuff that i see you could tell that they have a certain passion for just like building this stuff because it helps serve people you know mm -hmm. help serve other people and um and so it's great to hear like um, from a vendor perspective, what that's that's basically you know one of the reasons why you are are, are you know continue to do this as well as you have that that same core sort of um, principle. Um, so while we're talking about that, do you have like a you know a favorite story about someone who's who's used your tool, um, Smart Builder, to build an e-learning project? Yeah, it, I mean, I, I think it's actually the 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 person who put on this this doctor that I mentioned recently was another doctor in Australia. And he he used to use I don't know where he got the idea from, but he he was doing the same type of training for for physicians on on uh, on on how to treat a, a pre I guess it was like premature infants, and he he long time ago built stuff in authorware even before my time, and wanted to kind of bring it to the the modern era with the web, and he was a uh, interested in Smart Builder the, the current version even back in the beta period, and as soon as we released it he he. He built uh, new modules and rebuilt his old modules that he had in Authorware and made them web friendly. And I've seen some of the stuff that he did, and I was kind of amazed that someone who's not even an L and D professional, he just did this on the side, I guess, on the weekends and the evenings, built some incredible, uh, some incredible e-learning that he gives away almost for free just to other doctors around the world. 
to make their skills better. And I think that was a great, a great thing to see someone doing with, with e-learning. And then one of these other doctors saw it and is now doing his own project along the similar veins just recently. So I think that was a great kind of uh, proof that e-learning can be effective and it can make a difference in the world. Yeah, it's well, done right, but it's got to be done right. Right, definitely. And I, and I think I like just hearing the fact that, you know, that, uh, you know, you've you've created this tool and that you are actually, you know, that that you see these projects that the the getting built and it's something that you that, that you're proud of. I think that and that you're totally accessible too as as like a founder and somebody who who has authored this particular tool. And I just want to mention John J Rock says, um, and Smart Builder has great uh, has good applicability to X API too, which um we can we can talk more about that like during a little bit of the demo, but um that's really, really good to hear. Um, okay, great. So yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We uh, we crossed paths on the XAPI cohort, and I'm glad to see you remembered us. <laughs> <laughs> no, excellent. I'm gonna I'm, I want to ask some more, and so just so that everybody knows, what we're gonna do is we'll, we're gonna just start with a little bit. Like I want people to get to know Rob a little bit more, and then we're gonna do we're just gonna jump into the tool and 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 and, and sort of check out some of its features, and 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 Rob has a, has a, has a great little demo that he's going to show us um, about smart builder, but there are some other things that I want to ask real quick, just because you're an industry vet. And I want to, I want to just see, like, just see what you have, what you have to say about, about some of these things. Um, so somebody that's just getting into e-learning, I have like a lot of my audience, especially the people that listen to, to podcasts. Do you have any advice that you would give to somebody who was just entering this field that's just coming in as an e-learning professional? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think there's there's a lot of um, noise out there in the e-learning space, uh, a lot of attention to fads. And it's a little bit hard for somebody who's just getting into it to kind of separate the, the wheat from the chaff, you know, to, to use a cliche. Um, and I think if I was just getting started in it, uh, I would look at some of the writings and the, and the, um, uh, the books of the the experts who started the Cirrus e-learning manifesto, uh, I don't know if any people on the on the call have heard of that, but it was uh, it was four 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 experts a few years ago, kind of were looking at the state of the industry and were somewhat frustrated by by it not realizing its potential. And um, yeah, thanks for putting that link in there. Mm -hmm. And um, so they they kind of listed some of the problems, but also some some of the the principles and the characteristics of, of what effective learning could be that's done right. And I'd say, you know, look at some of those experts and their books. I think all of them have written books and articles. And I would start by getting a foundation with uh, some, some of the timeless principles of what good e-learning design looks like. And, um, and, and, and start with that. I think that would be the, the best way to go. And then, of course, people talk about a lot about building a portfolio. You know, I think that's important. But uh, build your portfolio to, you know, to showcase your skills. Um, you know, using some of those principles. Don't just do the cookie cutter templates that look pretty, but don't have deeper, don't require deeper thinking and meaningful thinking on the part of your learners. You know, uh, be a little bit creative and, and push push the envelope a little bit when you when you build your portfolio. Yeah, and for those that are just listening to the recording in the podcast, you can find that 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 e-learning manifesto at um, elearningmanifesto.org. And I remember when that when that particular when when that came out, it was it actually was a pretty big deal. Um, you know, when I I was when I was at the guild and everybody, you know, it sort of hit like we weren't just we we had no clue that something like that was coming out. And with Michael Allen sort of leading it, and and you could see everybody else that um, mm -hmm. that helped like build that that particular manifesto. We're like, whoa, this is like pretty impactful. And um, and I'm glad that you brought it up because it has been a really really long time since um since I came up with it and yeah so I'm I'm also wondering if anybody else in the audience right now has heard of the e-learning manifesto um especially some of you um some of you e-learning you know current e-learning folks now because I think that's like what is it maybe like ten years old eight years old I mean, like that. not that old it was like five years maybe I don't know okay. it is I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like Rick says that he's heard of it, but Anne has, um, today's the first time that, that, that she, she's heard of the e-learning manifesto. Yeah. We thought that it was going to have a huge impact on, on the industry back when it was first launched. And I think that, you know, I'm glad you brought it up because I do think it is, you know, it has, it's, it's some great, you know, just some great, mm-hmm. great guidelines. Now with that said, how about the future of e-learning? I mean, do you see any trends that you're seeing? Like what, what should people be looking out for? And we're, you know, I mean, you know, everyone talks about VR and XR and AR and, you know, all that stuff. But is there anything? What, what do you think? You know, you ask 10, ask 10 experts to get 10 different answers. First of all, I'll put that caveat out there. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that I've, I've heard people talking about that kind of makes sense to me is, um, who was it? I think it was Clark Finn was drawing the analogy that if you look at, say, the marketing discipline, it's gotten much more sophisticated and data driven. Uh, marketers really understand what people are doing out there on the web. They can track all sorts of data based on where you click, click what size it is, your, you know, your, your, uh, your demographics, and they can draw conclusions about that to, to give you the products that you're looking for. It would be great if e-learning could, of course, it's not going to get to that level of sophistication because, you know, you, when you build some e-learning, it hasn't got necessarily the same investment as a, as a, as a product that you're selling. But it would be it would be great if you could um, do a much better job of tracking how it's being used and what people are doing in it, and draw conclusions about its efficacy. And I think that's one of the things behind XAPI is that it's it'd, it'd be great if you could track at a much grand, more granular level of detail and not always have your tracking being tied back to a monolithic learning management system. And so we're we're big proponents of XAPI. Smart Builder is very uh, very powerful in terms of what and what you can do with XAPI tracking. And giving that data to a, to a platform, an analytics platform, where an e-learning person can go and say, hey, I'm doing this, and my learners are not getting it, or they are getting it, or I need to change my e-learning based on the data that I'm seeing, that would be, I think, a powerful thing. So but just because something should be done doesn't mean it's, it's going to happen. I think it is going to you – know, I think one of the key things with it, one of the, the true things in our industry is change happens, but it happens a lot more slowly than, than people think it's going to. So I think that's the direction with – you know, more data-driven analysis of, of learning and, and making the learning more um, effective based on that data analysis. So that's, that's kind of one thing I see. Um, you hear a lot about AI um, and you hear a lot about, um, you know, micro learning. I think those are things that, you know, like a lot of things in our industry, people, when they hear a term like that, they interpret it differently depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, those things, I, I think they, they, I think certainly micro learning is, is people are interested in doing that, but, it, but doing it right also means, um, means I think it's not necessarily just taking a, an hour long uh, course and, and saying I'm going to deliver it in, in 10 minute chunks. You know, um, if, it, if, it, if by micro learning you mean we're going to do more performance support when that's appropriate. And that's not really even learning anymore. It's, that's performance support. You don't need to get it into your head. You just use it and throw it away, basically. Mm. So I think that can be effective. Um, and, and, you know, with, with AI, I think, you know, that's, we, we could delve into that, but that's a whole other discussion, I think. Oh, yeah, sure. I think that's, uh, that's going to take also longer before it's really starting to really uh, be used widely and effectively in the industry. So with, with data being so central, and, you know, that's definitely – you know, one of the like, you know, the most important things that you can sort of integrate into whatever you're building nowadays is is mm. you know, it's just the center of everything. But yeah. um, does it change how you approach creating your e-learning projects or how has it? I mean, it must. So mm-hmm. before you would, you know, I'm sure you could just create like these sort of these flash interactions and, and all that. Yeah. But now, it seems like you've got to have like a strategy first, your data strategy almost first before yeah. you laying out whatever your e-learning strategy is that's right um you you can't do it at the well you, it makes it harder to do at the end it's good to think about what, what are the metrics we'd like to, to take uh, out of this e-learning that will help us either know if it's effective or or know how to improve it you know that kind of stuff or to know if it's going to make an impact on the business um we we recently did a uh, consulting project for a uh, a company that does um they have they have systems that that, that do sort of close that do a camera monitoring of, of facilities basically and doing and they were doing a lot of software training and 
we, when we were building the software simulations, we put in XAPI hooks at every single step of the software simulation to see, so we could track where people are, are getting the simulations wrong because part of their software was, was proprietary and they could, on the one hand, they could improve the learning when, when people were getting the question, this, the, the software simulation steps wrong, they could improve the learning. So that's quite useful, but more importantly, they could change the software interface itself to say, hey, this is not an intuitive portion of the interface because <laughs> You know, people are just getting it wrong in the in, in learning in the simulated version of the, of the of the software. So maybe we need to think about the interface being improved. So we were able to track that because we put those hooks in each step of the of the software simulation to, to know if people got it wrong the first time each time they did a, a click or a text entry or whatever in the simulation. Well, so when you were planning the project out, this was that something that you you know you intentionally did that. You're like, okay, we're yeah. going to put these hooks to. Yeah. Yeah, we discussed that with with the uh, with the client before we we, did, we built anything. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear from the live audience if you guys, you know, any of you e-learning producers that are out there, if if that's something that you guys currently do, if you if you kind of lay out your data strategy first and then and then just you know develop on top of that. I'm I'm, I'm really curious about that now. So. Um, let's start moving a little bit more into like sort of talking about smart builder um, mm -hmm. just like just a general e-learning tool question what do you think are the most important features that that an e-learning tool should have now like in 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 2020 and going forward well I don't think our, my, my answer to that hasn't changed since the day one since day one the most important thing is it's got to have the power and the flexibility to create meaningful learning experiences uh, and what is a meaningful learning experience? Well, it's some of the principles that I, I mentioned that were kind of listed out in the uh, in the um, e-learning manifesto. You want to have, for example, you know, uh, case-based scenarios, uh, gamification, um, uh, use of variables. I mean, those are some of the, the, the attributes that you have to be able to support an e-learning tool. But you have to. I mean, it, it's great to be um, a purist, but you also have to recognize you've got to be able to build that stuff fast. You can't, no, no one's going to want to hire a team of coders to build meaningfully learning. You want to build meaningfully learning and do it at a reasonable cost and time frame. So you need that capability. I think that's one thing. Uh, more recently, of course, it's got to, it's got to be mobile friendly. Um, at a minimum, it has to run on every device. But I think almost every authoring tool now will run on any device. But going beyond that, it's good if you can also make it responsive to certain devices for certain projects. Not every project needs to be on a, on a phone. In fact, many don't. But it's nice to not be limited to just, you know, shrinking the screen on a phone. If that's if you are going to deliver it on a phone, it's good to be able to kind of have it re responsive to uh, like a, a portrait layout. Mm -hmm. So I think that that capability is kind of essential in a, in a modern offering tool as well. And then you know, kind of. The you know following up on what I was saying about being able to proper uh, analysis of your e-learning, you got to have strong XAPI capabilities as well. Mm -hmm. And by XAPI capabilities, most tools will just focus on saying tracking the same type of data that they would do with SCORM, which means did someone complete the e-learning? Did they get a score of X Y Z? You know that kind of stuff. So that's fine. That's nice for some projects, but. Like the example I gave with the software simulation, if you want to track what are, what do people do in each step of a software simulation, for example, you need to be able to do that with say XAPI and do that easily without having to go outside and code it in JavaScript or something like that. So I'd say those are like my top three. You know, meaningful meaningful learning experiences, mobile friendly, and and XAPI capabilities, strong XAPI capabilities. Nice. Yeah. Like Alan is saying, yes, mobile friendly is a must. And then J rock is like, that's right. We already have SCORM make the XAPI do more. Totally agree yeah. with that. Um, so let's talk about, you know, when you say meaningful interactivity and, and serious e-learning, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> um, well, let me, let me start with uh, an example. Not even an example. I'll, actually, I'll come to the example later. Let me um, let me do a little a little game here, and we'll we'll kind of talk about some of the principles. But what I'm going to ask you to do is, if anyone had clicked on that link for the learning manifesto, go ahead and close that window for the moment, so we don't have any cheaters. <laughs> I'm going to do a little game. We're going to do a little game where we're going to see what people maybe recall or can figure out from that. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Do you know how to do that? You just have to mouse over your yourself, and then you'll see a, a, a little drop down on the, on the uh, screen, and then you can as a little share share button there. 
All right, I'm going to need you guys' help in the audience for this one. So, uh, um, please. <laughs> so, um, all right. Now, can you can you see a a, a page that says Serious Learning Manifesto? Yeah, yeah, Serious okay. Learning Manifesto. Great. All right. So this is the this is a cut and paste of the text, kind of preamble text on the on the e-learning manifesto page, kind of listing the the frustrations with the state of e-learning. And what we're going to do is on this on this little game here, um, we're going to see. Emma, I actually have to bring up the chat. Don't I? Chat. I can read it off to you if you want. Okay, all right. So let's just see. We're gonna we're gonna see how well as an audience we do collectively on the smart meter. So does anyone want to venture? What is the serious e-learning corresponding characteristics for content focused. <laughs> I'll read it up. Um, Rick immediately said performance. J-Rock said people. All right, we got we got one correct answer. Performance is the right answer. So we earned we earned a correct answer and our smarter meter went up. All right. Anyone want to have a stab at this next one? Meaningful for okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. what do we got? Rick said learners. Um, Ruby said learning. Alan said learning. Ann says learners. Yes, correct answer. As long as I get one correct answer, I'm going to keep going. How about the next one? <laughs> J Rock said lunch. Okay. And then E, okay, what do we got here? Um, e, something driven. Okay. Ruby says experience. Um, Rick says evidence. Alan says experience. Jonathan J Rock says ego. <laughs> So as I'm typing hints here, we're 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 using up hints, and the and the smarter meter is going down. Ah, engagement. Rick says engagement. Yeah. Ann says engagement. Okay. Well done. All right. Next one. This is fun. Um, A and then contexts. Okay. Um, <laughs> J Rock says my smarto meter wasn't that high to begin with. <laughs> um, he has a smart asso meter. Great. Ann says actual. For this one, oh, okay. So A U T, um, authentic. Yes, Anne's yeah. authentic. Oh, Anne's brilliant. So of course, oh, Rick says authentic as well. Um, fact now we're into the, we've taken away the scaffolding, so there's no no initial uh, text here. So. <laughs> All right, and then let's see, Ruby, rational for decisions. Oh, R E. <laughs> Rick says real. Um, Close enough. It's realistic. Good enough. Realistic. There you go. All right. Excellent. All right. And, One size fits all versus. And something challenges. Uh, what do we got here? And says personalized. Uh, oh, wait. That's, that's, gonna I. In fact, that's a synonym. We're going to say. Well, I'm giving you credit for that one because individualized. Personalized. Yeah, Rick said individualized. And then let's see, one time events, blank practice. This is a tough one. Ah, uh, Jonathan says um, spaced. Yes, that's, that's one of the, the, the principles that Will Thalheimer talks about a lot. Yeah. One of the most powerful principles in, in learning uh, recall. And then the last one <laughs> didactic feedback. Let's see. Let's see, we've got an R there. Um, Rick says good and then bad. Let's see. J Rock, Tara. <laughs> risk. Okay, that we got real there. All right. And Ann says real life. Close enough. Real world. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Overall, extremely average. <laughs> well done, everybody. <laughs> so, so you so Thank you. Can I answer your question there about what I mean by seriously learning? <laughs> These are. Uh, these are some of the principles that, that go into what we mean by serious learning, but um, maybe an example of it in practice uh, would, would be even better. So yeah. I can show you an example, yeah. No, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for putting us through that. <laughs> J-Rock says he was the weakest link in that game. Uh, let's see what happens with the next one. <laughs> uh, let's see. For some reason, my Chrome is uh, freezing up on me. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's this is an example from our examples page on our website, and I think it's it's kind of cool because it, it it puts some of these these principles into action. So um, starts off with your this is this is 
designed for someone who's a consultant who has to go out and set up laptops for presentations in, say, a conference room or something like that. I want to make sure that, the, that the, the, the consultant knows how to set up their laptop. So it starts off with your basic sort of click to learn more type of interactivity, where I click on a, a port. I can see, hey, it's the VGA. This is a little bit old. Most, most laptops don't have a VGA anymore. But you know, see what the, what the port, what the cable looks like, how it's used. And once you feel like you know the answer, you can click on skip the challenge. So we'll go ahead and do that. And so we've got a colleague here who says, hey, I've been working really hard to, on my presentation. I'm going to say hello. And she needs help getting her laptop set up in the boardroom. But the meeting is going to start in two minutes. So this is this is a couple of things here. First of all, it's it's authentic context. It's a, sort of a scenario that the learner could realistically see themselves be in, and um, and you'll see as we get into it, there's also some some real world consequences built into the the the, the, the feedback as I get stuff right and wrong. And it's also it's also meaningful because um, and, and engagement driven because you'll see as as. As I go, there's a, a risk element, which adds an element of gamification to it, makes me more engaged and, and pay closer attention to it because I've got to get it done in a certain amount of time. So let's go ahead and get started. And my first challenge or first task is she wants to get online. So I say, okay, let's take a look. And and there's a few, and this is this demonstrates that you can have um, uh, a multi a multi step task. So not so first of all, I need to know which is the correct cable to choose. So to get online, what if I incorrectly say, oh, I need to use a USB cable for that. So I might take the, a cable and stick it in the correct port, but it's the wrong cable to use in the first place. So if I drop it here, I get some intrinsic feedback. She frowns at me, and my time, I just wasted 30 seconds, my timer is shot down by a certain amount, mm -hmm. which is, again, the real world consequence of getting it wrong, not just saying that's incorrect, but use the correct choice. Now, what if I choose the right cable, which is in this case is the um, Ethernet cable, but I try to stick it in the wrong, the wrong port. Well, then it's just going to say it doesn't fit and it snaps back. But if I take the right cable and stick it in the right port, then she smiles and, and I earn a completed task and I can go into the next one. So I, I think this one uses some of the elements of the CRC learning ma manifesto to make this more engaging, more meaningful, more realistic practice of, of the skill that you're going to have to have when you do this for, for, for real on the job. Mm -hmm. So that uh, kind of brings it home a little bit. That's fantastic. And so this is, you know, this was developed with Smart Builder, right? Yeah, all this was done in Smart Builder. Uh, and you can take a look at this on our examples page. You go to Smart Builder um, and then click on the examples um, tab on our website. Excellent. Yeah. Oops, let me do this. Can you show us? Do you want to get it all and, and just show us like the interface of Smart Builder? Is that something we could take a look yeah, at? Yeah, sure. Let me, uh, let me, uh, Reshare my screen here. Sorry, I turned it off a little bit early there. You know, maybe even if um, I don't know if you have like uh, an example of how you built the, the game earlier, that might be kind of fun to take a look at. Yeah, I mean, if we have time, let me let me start with something a little bit simpler, and then I can, okay. I can, I can jump into that. So, uh, can you see my screen? Got a sort of a blank page here in Smart Builder. Not yet. No. Oh no. Okay. Um, I thought I said share. Hold on a sec. Let me. Oh, I know why. Okay, here we go. How about now? There we go. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. So this is this is Smart Builder, and uh, let's go ahead and, and start adding some content to our page. So over here on the left, we've got what we call objects. So the objects are the granular building blocks that you would use to build out your content. And so if I click on one of these, like for example, I click on the text, I just draw down the page like you would with a PowerPoint and type in your text. And then if you wanted a button, you click on the button object, you draw that out on your page, um, and so on. So you can also have shapes. And with any, with any object, you can also change the look and feel of using the properties. So for example, if I have a, um, let's say a radio button group, if I wanted to make these more vertically spaced out, I could go to my, go over to my properties, and one of the one of the properties for a radio button group is its vertical spacing. Mm -hmm. Now it's more spaced out. Or if I wanted this to be, you know, a different color, I could I could uh, 
use one of our pre-built styles and, and change that to a different, you know, different color. Mm -hmm. So you basically go, go about adding objects, moving them, resizing, resizing them, pretty similar to you would do with other tools. Um, where, where things start to get kind of unique and fun with Smart Builder is how you do your interactivity, which is all through this area we call the action canvas over here on the right. So let me go ahead and build out a little bit of sample content. Let's just, let me just kind of clear the stage here. And let's say we want to just have a simple action that says when I have a, a button, I'll just have the button label say hide, for example. I want to hide a shape. So I'll take a, a shape here, an X shape. And I'm going to uh, just style it. So like I said, let's just say we want to do a little simple action. It says, okay, when I click on this, I want to hide that. Well, how would I do that? Well, I'll start with our trigger. In this case, it's the, it's the button. So I click on the button. And as I'm clicking on these objects, you might notice there's this panel here that has all these colorful puzzle-shaped blocks, which we call action blocks. And in this case, the one that I'm going to want to use is the blue one that says when the hide button is clicked, I want to do something. So I'll, I'll grab that and drag it over this white area we call the, the canvas, and I'll release it. And then for my response, I'll click on this shape over here, and then I get a panel again for all the different action blocks for the currently selected object, which in this case is the shape. And then I can do all sorts of stuff. Now, this is a true object-based authoring system, so it's a little bit different than other tools, which other tools generally have a sort of a, a generic list of, of things you can do. You can show and hide, you can pause and play, you can go to the next page, you know, those kind of basic things. And of course, you can do that same stuff here, but you can also do more advanced stuff, like I could change the fill color, or I could, uh, you know, scale it or change the angle. Uh, but in this particular example, all I want to do is say hide it, for example. So I'll grab the block that says hide, and then I just need to combine these to complete my action. So I take this puzzle-shaped block and snap it into the, the socket here. So now I've got a complete action. That's, let me kind of zoom in a little bit here. That says when the button is clicked, hide the X mark. And we can you know, maybe make it a transition effect, like a fade. And that's pretty much it. So that's your basics of, of creating logic. So if I, if I preview this, um, if I click on the, the button, it's going to hide the, the X. Mm. So, so far, so good. That's pretty easy to do. But that's not all that different than what you would do with pretty much any authoring tool. Um, where, it starts, where it starts to get more fun is where you want to start layering more stuff on top of that. So one of the things you can do with Smart Builder is you can have multiple triggers and multiple responses. And, and you can do things that, that take advantage of the sort of object-oriented nature of Smart Builder. So as an example, let's say I want to have a slider on my page here. And let's say that as I move my slider handle, I want to rotate this, um, this shape. So what I could do is I could say, OK, when the slider changes, each, time, each moment that the slider is changing, I want to rotate this, this X. So I'll go back and select the X. I just find the block that says angle, which, you know, I'm going to set the angle basically, which means rotate it. And well, what do I want to set it to? Well, if I leave this little purple block here, I could set it to a specific degree of, of rotation, like 90 degrees. But that's, that's not what I want to do. And what I want to do is as I'm moving this handle, I want to kind of pair them up. So whatever, whatever value the slider is, I want to make the rotation of this correspond to. So I can go back to my slider. And I can do this, use this block that's sort of getting the data out of the slider, which has this sort of, this shape to it. And I can say, set the angle of the shape to the value of the slider. So let's go ahead and just try that. Oh, let's, let's, let's have our slider start at zero as well. We'll start at, instead of 50, we'll switch it to zero. We'll just go ahead and preview that. And you'll see as I start to move this, my, my, uh, my shape rotates, you know, whichever direction I'm going. And they're kind of in sync now. So that's kind of taking advantage of some of the, the object-oriented power of Smart Builder. Mm. Um, what if I wanted to maybe additionally make this get fade out as I'm going? I could say, yep, I'll just click on this shape. And instead of changing the angle, I'm going to change its, its, um, its transparency. So I could say, OK, set the transparency to that same slider value. So basically what that means is as I as I move up towards, this is on a, a 0 to 100 scale, as I move to the right towards 100, it becomes increasingly transparent. 
So if I preview that, it starts off fully opaque, zero transparency, and as I rotate it, slide it, it's lighter and lighter and more and more transparent until it disappears. So that, that's, that's kind of the basics of how you do logic um, and some of the little bit more advanced stuff, like not only showing and hiding, but also getting data out of one object and using it as a sort of an input to another object, as, I, as I've shown you here. Yeah. J-Rock has a question. Um, yeah. Can you alter the slider, like swap the thumb with an image? Yeah. So th that all comes down to kind of the static properties of it. So for example, if I wanted the uh, handle style to be a dot, I could use make it to a dot, or I could choose um, custom. Where is it? Uh, what was a custom? Yeah, custom handle. I could use an image for it right here. And then you can also change, you know, the colors of the the channel. For example, uh, make it. I don't know. Let's make it uh, green. For example. So certainly the customization, look and feel customization is important. So it, it, it gives you all that kind of capability. Let's see, M is asking if Smart Builder supports SVGs. Um, at the moment, not. Uh, we're, we're thinking about adding that as a, as a uh, image type. Um, it's, uh, at the moment, it's using, it's for, from a graphics perspective, it's going to be PNG and uh, JPEG and GIF. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Yeah. And then for beginners, uh, I'll just point this out quickly. I mean, this I'm kind of showing you sort of building stuff from scratch. Of course, there are common presentation models and interaction models like quiz, quiz questions where you wouldn't want a beginner to have to build this all from scratch. So that would be a good use case where you might want to use a template. So if I go here and add a template, I could do, for example, you know, a, 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 a like a multiple choice question or a drag and drop. And then if I apply that, it's going to let me populate that all using a form field interface, basically. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Jrox asking if there's any support for animated GIFs. Yeah, animated GIFs will work in there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was thinking about showing that, you know, how you set up the, uh, the little game that we did, but I, I'm, I'm also cognizant of the time that this would take, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more involved than, than most people are, are really want to pay attention to right now. But um, yeah, I'll just maybe stop and see what questions people have or what they'd like to see. Let's see if you guys, do you guys have any other questions? Let me, you know, we are um, uh, yeah. running short on time, but how about cool things on your roadmap? What do you got? Anything in the future that you've got, uh, got planned for the product? Yeah. Um, so some of the stuff we're working on is um, it's kind of funny. When we first started with Smart Builder, we it was it was browser based, um, using Flash as the authoring environment and the output. And then with the more recent version, it's you know HTML5 output and desktop based. Mm -hmm. But we want to get back to uh, having some of the advantages of a of a, of a uh, browser based software, which is mainly around the ability to share assets and projects uh, um, among uh, distributed team members. Hmm. So one of the things we're working on is a shared content repository that you can sync to uh, up in the cloud. It'll have, you know, if you've got projects you want to share with other people, um, we're working on, on that feature. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, another thing we're working on is at the moment, our software simulations, uh, you import the, the, the media, uh, that you use in your simulations from, you know, externally, and we were going to add a uh, screen capture capability to, to augment that. Um, yeah. Some of the other stuff we've been working on is um, doing more with XAPI around kind of learner to learner mm -hmm. um, stuff. So uh, um, we, we've done some stuff with uh, like being able to do it a leaderboard in your, in your, uh, in your e-learning, uh, like polls, and um, uh, be able to see what other people have answered on certain questions. So you oh. kind of, uh, we've even done one where you, one of our projects for the XAPI cohort, where you could um, have a, a question about like, how would you respond to a certain scenario and see what other people taking the lesson uh, have answered and then choose to analyze that, like who's, who's put in a similar question, a similar response to you, a different response to you, 
critique how it compares to your response. That some of that kind of learner to learner um, capability that XAPI affords, I think, could be really powerful for for more engagement with e-learning. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly yeah. enough, like J Rock put a posted a question in the QA area, which kind of sort of speaks a little bit to some of these new features of you know looking at collaboration and putting things in the cloud. Um, but he's he's just asking, how do you see possible coronavirus quarantines impacting the public? perception of the value of e-learning i mean i've been hearing a lot of, about that mm -hmm. in the news and um you know it's it's one of the reasons why I'm, you know I'm, i i love putting focus into these you know into these online events but yeah. um, any have you do you have any thoughts on that on coronavirus well, you know i, I think it's a bigger impact is it Oh, I was just going to say, just that, you know, even in China right now, people there, people are just really getting more focused on building e-learning curriculums just be, by necessity, right? So, yeah. You know. yeah. I mean, it can only help drive demand for, for e-learning, you know, I, I think, um, you know, th whether that's for synchronous or asynchronous, I don't know, you know, uh, but... I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, from the, from an industry perspective, I don't see any, I don't see any harm in that, you know, mm -hmm. that extra emphasis on people doing stuff remotely. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Well, Rob, this has been great. I can't thank you enough for, um, for joining us this morning. My first meet the maker guest. <laughs> I'm definitely going to feature you out there. Um, can you do me a favor and if in chat, if you could just post like a link to your website where people can get a hold of you, um, yeah. your contact information. Um, what about you know, if people wanted to try out Smart uh, Smart Builder, is that do you have anything like you know any options for that? Yeah, I mean, if you just go to our website, which I'm typing in right now. Um, you'll see right there on the homepage. There's a get my free trial or something like that right there, an orange button on the homepage. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. Uh, you can see that pretty easily there. And I'll put, uh, I'll put out there our LinkedIn group and our blog as well. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So and it, it, most importantly, Luis, am I number, are we number 600? No, we're not. We're not number 600. Um, we're close. I actually have this 600th event like in the program, but we're, we're really close. I think we're like at 597 or something like that. Uh, we almost got there. We almost got there. But uh, yeah, so everybody, just so you know, like, gosh, I mean, 600 TLDC online events, that's nuts. Like, um, you know, and of course, a huge part of that was when um, Brett and I were doing these every day. But mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to stop anytime soon. So, uh, so, so it's, it's a big deal. Um, but I'm glad that you, we've got you in the books and, yeah. um, and also you've kind of like inspired me to kind of consider like having a regular TLDC game show because yeah. that was so fun doing that. Like, you know, J-Rock, maybe I should hit you up and we can, we might be able to do like a, we should do a regular game show. Cause that was, that was a lot of fun. And I think you know, we'd that. be happy to sponsor that and, and help build those, you know, Okay. <laughs> Sponsored by Smart Builder. Okay. Well, um, I'll give it some thought and um, but uh, but thanks again for your time today. And everybody, um, just so you know, I've got the storytelling playlist is ready. Um, I might be looking for a couple more guests for March, but if you go to uh, the homepage, tldc.us, you'll see a link, or you can go to our Crowdcast page and see, see a link to it. We've got some good stuff going on next month, including improv and comedy and scenario-based e-learning and instructional story design. So that's happening next month. And um, tomorrow we've got Alex Salas. We're going to be talking about uh, certifications and the CPLP changing to the CP, CPTD. Yeah, CPTD. So that's tomorrow morning. And other than that, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Nice to see you all virtually. <laughs> see you, Rob. Bye. Bye.